Evening. Are you right? I hope you're doing really well. Uh, I hope you've had a fantastic Christmas and a great new year and welcome back. This is obviously the first one of, of 2024. Um, I hope you're all good and uh, I hope you're keeping warm because it's bloody freezing in the UK tonight. So yeah, it's, it's really cold. Um, obviously t- tonight, obviously we have a guest. We've got Paul Hobday in. Now, obviously straight away with Paul, he's very, very kind of experienced guy. We're going to talk to him about kind of his background in the paranormal, but also his involvement with brand new society, the UK Paranormal Society, that um, has, has been in the works for a couple of years, but actually was now now up and running, qualified, you know, and got charity status and things like that. So, want to chat to him about the UK Paranormal Society, um, his role, in, you know, on TV that he had as ghost chasers and how that's affected his involvement in the paranormal. But also, it's a really good opportunity for all, as ever, for you guys at home. If you've got questions for Paul and you want to put things to him, now's the time to start thinking basically about what you'd like to chat to. So, without further ado, because I don't want to keep him waiting for too long, because the man is suffering because <laughs> he's just been diagnosed with COVID. It's let's bring in Paul. Evening. Hi, Justin. Good evening. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> like I say, just said, you know, obviously you've got COVID. You battled on to the podcast. So thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have missed it for anything, Justin. <laughs> God, bloody right. <laughs> oh, God, I don't like that one. It's a bit too, this bit too close. Let's get back here. Right. Um, so thank you for coming on, first of all. I like I say, I, I, it, it's kind of funny because we've, obviously been involved with the society or I've been involved with the society for a little while you've been in obviously from the start but for those that don't know you for the those that kind of don't know what you're about or your background in the paranormal at all could you just perhaps say a little bit about where it all started for you yeah certainly so um I suppose very similar to most who have an active interest or involvement in the paranormal My interest dates back to childhood. I was always interested in the ghost related kids TV shows back in the 80s and giving away my age a bit there. Um, Right the way through to uh, in my childhood home, um, we did have things happen that you may describe perhaps as poltergeist type activity during teenage years. Uh, So that was something that fueled the interest even further. Um, And then going into sort of later teens, I developed more of an interest in it and did things like A-level psychology, purely because they had a module on parapsychology within there. Um, and then it sort of progressed from there. That then led into that era of the paranormal TV shows starting to come out. So oh, yes. Most Haunted and all of those, yeah. which um, probably are responsible for a lot of us being interested in it now. Um, then there's a natural progression was to start going out on ghost hunts with friends, um, going on some uh, public events. And then um, whilst attending those public events, I got asked if I wanted to work for one of them. So back in 2009, I started working as an event host for Haunted Happenings, one of the event companies here in the UK. So that gave me the opportunity to go around the UK, visiting some amazing locations, um, leading ghost hunts and getting paid to do it, which was fantastic. So it's, huge it's opportunity. Rare, <laughs> it really is. Usually, yeah. Even the- you usually lose money when you do the paranormal. <laughs> yeah, see, even the paying part is rare these days for hosting yeah. events, from what I understand. Uh, most do it on a voluntary basis. So, yeah, back then it was a paid role. Um, and uh, I was doing that for, I think, about 2011. And during that time, um, that's when I first started to get involved in the TV side of things as well. So it was all still very entertainment based at this time. It was yeah. the entertainment from watching the TV shows, going on entertainment events hosting events and then in 2010 uh, I did the first TV show that I was uh, lucky enough to be part of and that was a live show on living TV on Halloween weekend in 2010 and that's where there was two teams who had to investigate a castle up in Scotland live for three hours on the Saturday and Sunday night uh, on on TV uh, back on back in the days of uh, when we used to do live um, televised ghost hunts for Halloween yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, that there, obviously, yeah. there's still that all of that from Most Haunted. Uh, you know, them doing Most Haunted Lives, I suppose, it gave you the kind of freedom to be able to do that and get, you know, to have the production company to to pay for something like that, basically. Absolutely. Um, and this was uh, a great opportunity. It was, again, still very entertainment-based, but it was a great insight in terms of how that side of things worked. Um, was, no, go, go on, yeah, sorry. I was, I was going to say, because most guys or 
women who are kind of into the paranormal they go out investigating they do it as a hobby they kind of may go around certain supposed haunted locations or pay to go on go with ghost event companies and you've had you've done all of that and you've seen all of that but also we are you know as investigators very critical of tv shows right yes. so what i'm what i'm loving the, is the fact that you've seen it from both sides you know you've you've yeah. been in, out there investigating plus you've had that background of seeing how a tv production company sets up something like that and also kind of pressures i suppose on you to produce results in some way i mean what was your overall experience about you know do, doing the tv stuff and obviously you had a whole series of ghost chasers which is really popular plus you did all the live things as well i mean how how do you feel with your investigator hat on and all of that kind of experience with with tv with through the tv shows yeah, so the, the live shows were very entertainment based. Um, to just give you an idea, I've done two live paranormal TV shows, both of them um, fairly small locations, but you had about 200 crew in the background that you don't see on TV. So imagine 200 people on a ghost hunt yeah. um, <laughs> all around you, around every corner, there's someone hiding. There's like a, a, a rigger or a sound man or a cameraman or, or whatever. So you've got about 200 people on location for one of those. So there's no way you can do a, a real investigation. It is just purely um, introducing the subject matter and looking at a fantastic location uh, to, the, to the public, but it is very entertainment based. The, um, the series that I did back in 2016, Ghost Chasers, that was more realistic. It's still TV, so it's still entertainment, um, but it was as realistic as we could get within the realms of what TV producers want. So with that one, that was, um, 20 locations across the UK and Europe, spread across 10 episodes. So each episode was an hour long and we had two locations per episode. That one was much smaller. So we had the four of us who were on the screen and then behind the scenes, we only had a very small team. So we just had a cameraman, a sound man, a director and what they call a data wrangler. So that's the one processing the memory cards and acting as second camera when needed and so on. Yeah. And that was it. Um, we'd also have a runner if needed. So the translator in each of the countries, um, but it was kept very, very small. So we had them as an extended part of the investigation team, as you like. And we'd often refer to the cameraman or the sound man asking them if they'd seen what we had perhaps experienced. Yeah. Um, it was still TV. So there was still the, um, the, um, the license, I suppose, to be a bit creative with some of it. And I don't yeah. mean faking activity, but when you see things like us stood around talking about things, when you've got a single cameraman, we have to do that multiple times. So that same conversation is held maybe four or five times to get the shots from the different angles. So there's all those sorts of things that are the TV elements that get I, brought I, into it. I get from you that obviously the, the series, like you say, that you've, you've got to kind of toe the line to some extent because obviously it's a TV production, it's all entertainment only and all of that kind of stuff. Mm. But I, I get from you that it was kind of more enjoyable experience because it was a smaller team rather than having these great big massive productions with like you say with loads and loads of people around every corner was it frustrating you know when you when you're doing these lives that that was the kind of circus that was going on around you it was and and with those then um you are uh, specifically instructed to react to whatever noise you hear uh so <laughs> right. if you hear a noise around the corner you have to react to it and then if you find out it's the cable puller who's just hiding around the corner then yeah. that's up to them whether they show that or not but for the first one I did back in 2010, we went through, well, I think it must have been about four months of training of how to uh, present ourselves on TV doing a ghost hunt. So it was up at uh, Tutbury Castle. Oh, right, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it was once a week for yeah, several months going up there and practicing how to walk into a room, how to describe the room, how to react to things. And again, it wasn't about faking it, but it was about um, portraying the reaction to the viewing audience um really so, see, yeah. that, see i find that really fascinating yeah. because obviously you you expect you know when you when you see tv shows you expect the kind of the reactions to be genuine to a certain extent and the fact that you've had training you know inverted commas to kind of portray how you're meant to react yes is is actually just very very interesting in itself that you actually had quite a, i mean that sounds quite a lot of kind of tuition to actually present yourself in that way 
It is. I mean, if you think of the investigations you've been on and anyone else who's listening, if you've been on an investigation or a ghost hunting event, when something happens, maybe it's a noise or something perhaps catches a corner of your eye, you may just sort of stand there silently, second glance, trying to work out what did you just see. You may quietly whisper it to someone next to you. Yep. But on a TV show, you can't do that because you're there trying to describe to the audience at home what's been experienced, the idea being to try and bring them into it. So that's what they were trying to get out of that is how do we be a lot more descriptive in our body language and our words in terms of what's what's been experienced. Um, but they also, certainly for the lives, it was very much a case of being instructed to react first and then debunk after. Right. OK. Yes. And was that the same kind of thing with ghost chasers or, or, or were you able to kind of, you know, like um, react in a more genuine way when it was ghost chasers? That was more genuine. Um, we had um, more control over that one in terms of um, being able to maybe influence or coach the directors and producers in terms of what we'd like to see from a paranormal investigation. So, for example, we made sure there was no night vision on this one. We wanted it to be different. It was the first uh, paranormal TV show to be filmed entirely in 4K, ultra high definition. No night vision, all in natural light. So how a person would normally experience that venue. Um, yeah. even things like the investigation styles and so on. Now there's some things that we, where we had our hand forced a bit, certainly in terms of the equipment that was being used, those sorts of things, because it was low budget. So we didn't have any budget to purchase equipment like you see on some of the other shows. We had to beg, borrow, borrow and well, not steal, but get, gather as much as we could for free to help us on that show. So we had some very, um, generous companies out there like FLIR Systems who donated uh, FLIR thermal imaging cameras to us to use on loan. And then otherwise it was a case of just borrowing what we could. So we were limited in that sense, but we tried to keep it as realistic as possible and provide that balance so that the audience could make up their own mind as to whether it was paranormal or not. So yeah. I was there to try and give a more rational explanation as to what was been experienced. And Ian was there as the medium giving the more spiritual explanation. So we'd pre present both sides and let the audience decide for themselves, which they th thought it was. And for those that are very skeptical of TV shows, just kind of to, you know, you know, just to make it very kind of explicit, were you ever told to fake stuff? No, never. Um, and on Ghost Chasers, um, there was very strict rule there uh, that if any crew member was found to be faking things, then there'd be sort of pretty strict consequences from the exec producer um, and any such footage would not be used. So they were quite strict on that. Oh, that's good. That, I mean, that's, that's kind of, it's, it's kind of, it's nice to actually hear that to be yeah. honest. <laughs> Cause I, you know, that, you know, is very rarely do you get actually chance to speak to people who have been like, say behind the camera, like you yeah. have. Um, right then. So moving away a little bit from TV stuff and yourself, right. Obviously, you've been very much, or the you were the driving force of the UK Paranormal Society from the very beginning. It's essentially, let's get it right, your own, you know, uh, your own thoughts about setting up a new society from the very beginning. Why did you feel it? We needed one because I, I, know, I know that quite a, there's there's been this kind of criticism of the UK Paranormal Society from longer established societies such as the society for psychical research and asap and the ghost club why did we need in the uk a new society and why did you feel it was necessary yeah really good question um so um I, I suppose the first one is that it was never intended to compete with those other organizations like asap spr ghost club snu the other ones that are out there um, the idea of the UK Paranormal Society was to set up something completely different that uh, filled what I and the other founders perceived to be a gap in the paranormal field or paranormal community. So having been involved in the entertainment side of things for, for all those years with the um, ghost hunting events, the TV shows and so on, what I was seeing is a big decline in the ethics of paranormal practitioners. Um, but at the same time, there was a massive increase in interest in the subject. So you've got ethics declining, but interest massively increasing. And that, yeah. that's starting to cause a problem. And having been involved in the TV side and the, the TV show Ghost Chasers was still being aired on really and other channels at the time, I was getting lots of inquiries from people um, asking about how to get into the paranormal. Um, but it was never to try and progress research. It was always on the entertainment side of things. 
And what I was seeing is that the methods used in these TV shows were being um, copied and used not just on events at hired locations, but when people are going into members of the public's homes. And that starts to cause ethical concerns when using entertainment based methods and gadgets. We're going into a, a family member's home offering services, sometimes for a fee. Some of these uh, groups were charging a fee at the time. Also, because of the cost of hiring a historic or haunted location to go and do your ghost hunt and that big increase in people wanting to get involved, I was also seeing more unethical practices in terms of trying to get locations for free. So trespassing, breaking into venues and so on. And even over the last few days, there's there's been situations that have hit social media where groups have allegedly um, trespassed or even broken into historic properties to try and investigate for free. And it's this issue that start, started to really raise alarm bells for me. And having been involved in the entertainment side of things and realizing that the TV shows I've been part of were partly to blame for these practices, I wanted to try and do something about it. So back in late 2018, I came up with the idea of launching a new society or a charity that would try and fill the gap of uh, providing a um, easy go-to place of information about how to do things correctly and ethically. So what are the rules on things like trespass? What insurance do you need? How do you treat members of the public ethically and fairly? So it's all about trying to prevent harm. And the idea being is that we would also signpost to the other organizations as well. So it's not treading on the toes of ASAP or SPR who do some great work. SPR are fantastic when it comes to the academic research. ASAP are great with the training courses and webinars that they do. Um, the idea being this would signpost to those. So we're not going to be copying what they're doing. We're trying to fill a gap of providing a, um, a simple hub or information resource for everyone from paranormal investigators to mediums and psychics to members of the public to the operators of heritage locations as well, um, because there wasn't really a, a central hub available for them to get information. They were just copying yeah. what they were seeing other teams doing. Yeah. And if they picked an unethical one, that was the model that was being followed. I, I said that there was, I mean, the, the reason obviously I kind of got involved because I was obviously, and, and a lot of paranormal investigators who've been doing this a while have, have seen and heard kind of horror stories, absolute horror stories mm -hmm. of things that have been going on, uh, whether that's video recording, you know, in a graveyard of recent graves of people who have just died. Um, like you say, of of entering homes that are, they think are abandoned, but actually there may be people actually still living in that property at the time they kind of trespass into it. It's it was a mess to be honest, and I and I don't think it was properly being addressed in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I mean, I always always thought from the outset it it was just a, a really it was some, something that was desperately needed, and people weren't talking about about it enough. What I do have on here for people to have a little look at, so I'm hoping this kind of shows up. There we go. Oh dear, that's kind of, I've still got the Christmas stuff. Oh, gotta get rid of that. Okay, so for obviously, I'm just gonna very, very briefly kind of, obviously got, I can click on the, um, on the on, this is on the website. I don't know if you can see that on your screen, guys, but um, so this is the, the website of UK Paranormal Society. I'll put a link um, on, on the description. And also, I'm going to put it on the little um, ticker down below as well, so you can see that. But this, it go, if you go to ukparanormalsociety.org, this is the website. And I'm just going to very quickly go through. So we here we have site, you know, so we have an area of talking about code of ethics and things like that as, as guidance to help people. And we have feature articles, huge amount of guidance for the public guidance for heritage locations and paranormal practitioners it's all there it's it's very kind of it's it's very detailed um it's well worth looking through there's legal considerations and trespass law and bats and the a paranormal timeline of some key events there is there is just a huge amount to the website so if there's anybody who hasn't actually looked at that website properly or had had a little explore of it i think i'd I thoroughly thoroughly recommend it has my camera gone off i think it, it has, has yes <laughs> <laughs> i should try and get there we go oh dear that's the terrible camera but um oh blimey let's try and get that sorted that's my that's my that's my webcam oh dear but um 
I'll just actually, I'll just put you on, I'll put you on full, I'll put you, I'll to get rid of myself for a second and I'll just see and if you want to carry on maybe talking about a little bit about the website a second and then I'll just see if I'll get my camera back up and running. Bear with me one second. Yeah, guys. sure. Um, one of the things, Justin, that we wanted to do with the society is have an organization that was inclusive to all beliefs as well. So one of the things we notice is that some of the other organizations are more specific about the purpose. So it's more about scientific research um, or more about the spiritualist side. With the UK Paranormal Society, we wanted it to be inclusive of all belief systems. So it's not about influencing or telling people what to believe. It's more about uh, giving correct information about how to do the things that you enjoy in an ethical way. So in the members that we've got on board, our volunteers and trustees, we've tried to get a, um, a, a good mix of different belief systems and backgrounds. So in the society, we've got everything from skeptics through to people who are on the fence through to psychics and mediums. So when we're putting out guidance, for example, about different practices relating to psychics and mediums, for example, who better to help us with that than those who are practicing psychics and mediums who believe in good ethics? Because it's not my place to be telling a psychic medium how to act. I'm not a psychic. Um, yeah, I, I was just—I yeah. was going to say, kind of one of the things about the society was we're not trying to police people. No. It's more, like I say, it's more about guidance from the very beginning, isn't it? I mean, is there anything that people can do to kind of help the society as well? Is there anything that particularly you you would like to see people do, or you would like, to, you know, or if people are wondering how they could help basically yeah absolutely so we are a registered charity uh that was one of the important things we got established from the start um and it took us what three and a half years uh just in to get us launched um because of all the work that went into becoming a, a charity the reason why we registered as a charity is for two reasons one we have specific charitable purposes so that means that we are only here to serve and help members of the public and heritage locations, and then also the sort of the spider web that branches out from that. So that means assisting practitioners and so on as well. So we're here to help the public and we have specific purposes that are written into our constitution, which is the legal document we have as a charity and is authorized by the Charity Commission for England and Wales. So that means that if I was to step down, which I'll do eventually at some point, and the other trustees were to step down and uh, others to, were to leave, whoever comes in to replace us can't change the direction of what we're trying to do. They can't make it profit making. They can't change what it is. So it's all done as a completely um, non-for-profit charity. None of us get paid. We've self-funded it up till now, uh, apart from a couple of uh, kind, generous public donations, everything's been self-funded. So things people can do, uh, as a charity, then obviously we do accept donations, but that's not something we've been plugging up until now. We are very new. We didn't launch until October 2022. So this last year has just been sort of finding our feet, embedding ourselves in there, gradually getting ourselves known. This year, we're going to spend a bit more time trying to put more uh, information and guidance on the website and getting out there a little bit more in terms of trying to get ourselves known. So people can certainly share our articles, share the website, share the posts we're putting on social media. Um, if they want to get involved, then uh, we've also got um, vacancies as well. Uh, we're always looking for people who are um, accomplished article writers or would like to have a go at writing articles. Uh, or if there's other things that you might be able to help with, like help us with the website or help with social media. If you've got a good experience of that, we're looking for volunteers. Uh, the whole charity is run by um, what currently I think is 20 volunteers and trustees within the charity. So we're very reliant on people's goodwill and good nature to keep this charity running, including yourself, Justin. Yeah, <laughs> bloody right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say the, I suppose one of the, one of the great things I think as well is that the we're we're getting a lot of you know growing support. I would say from heritage locations and and charities linked to heritage locations. Because there has been this negative, really kind of, like I say, in the past, negative kind of view of paranormal groups, you know, for, for you know, for, for different reasons. But also, I think a lot of people are very kind of, not, not, but, uh, not scared, but say very wary of letting a paranormal group into if they have a, you know, if they look after a stately home. They've seen stuff on TV, they've, they've heard things in the news. And the, the good thing I would say is that, the society is working with different groups and things to try actually try and shine a positive light on the paranormal groups and how much it can actually help them. Maybe you want to say a little bit about 
that kind of avenue that we're up there also going down absolutely so i mentioned that as a charity we have to have specific charitable purposes that are authorized by the charity commission so one is about helping to protect the public from harm caused by misinformation malpractice and exploitation relating to the paranormal and that's legal wording basically to uh, establish what we're here to do and that's to help protect people who are um, potentially going to come to harm from the activities related to the paranormal so fraud and all those sorts of things and the, I mean, oh, sorry, go on, carry and on. The other one, number two, is similar, but it's there about helping to protect heritage locations and their histories from harm caused by the activities of the paranormal field. So that would be more around the trespassing, um, uh, taking advantage of locations, those sorts of things. And to answer yeah. your question there, then, yeah, we've um, we've joined two of the um, large umbrella organizations that are there to support historic locations. So we're members of Historic Houses, which is uh, for members who uh, own or manage or reside in um, your stately homes and those sorts of properties. And then also we're a member of Heritage Alliance, which again is a, a charitable organization there to support and act as a spokesperson um, or a body for heritage locations. So members of that include the likes of National Trust, English Heritage, Historic Royal Palaces, and so on. Uh, and Halloween just gone, we actually did a, a talk for their members about what we do and, and how they can turn the paranormal into a positive experience for their venues. Yeah, it looks like, it looks like, and particularly I'd say that for um, for those kind of, obviously not so much the English Heritage and the National Trust properties, but actually that the small privately owned very small charity or you know groups can actually benefit quite really quite well actually if they if they promote themselves in the right and it, with different avenues i would say as well not just ghost hunts but you know whether it's historical talks which involves ghost stories like you say at halloween and things like that just different revenue streams and just give it giving them some advice is has been really really good um where do you see the you know obviously we, we you know you started this off say 20 was it 2018 when you started this off and yeah. say 2024 now it's it's scary yeah. but in terms of trends of the paranormal and where you see things going is that is there anything particularly that you think is is like the biggest worry for you or something that is just a trend that you 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 think that actually the society can help in trying to sway people to go down like a different avenue is what do you think is the main issues at the minute from what I've seen, and this is just my sort of personal opinion of what I'm seeing out there on social media and hearing from from others within the society and elsewhere, um, the two main areas are one um, is the trespassing and breaking into heritage locations, um, or not even necessarily heritage locations, just supposedly haunted locations. And that could be anything from a graveyard of a church uh, through to breaking into a historic property, for example. That seems to be becoming more and more prevalent, whether it's because we're more aware of it now and so we're noticing it more or it's making social media more often or, or whether it is actually an increase in trend. Not sure, but certainly the interest in the paranormal seems to be massively increasing in terms of the number of, of groups and investigators out there. So trying to do something just to educate, as you said, we're not the paranormal police, we're not <laughs> intending to please. It's more about winning over hearts and minds, trying to educate through providing the free information and guidance on our website and through social media, making people aware of the ethical issues of, of trespassing at a location, the legal implications and so on. So that's one of the concerns. The other one is around um, investigating in people's homes, which is a free way of investigating. Um, or sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, some use it as a way of making money. I've seen some who charge for those services. And often with those, um, there is um, maybe not enough consideration given to the vulnerability of those in the home, the family, the children, uh, potentially those who are vulnerable or even maybe suffering from mental health conditions or, or other psychiatric conditions where those going in to investigate are maybe seeing it as a form of entertainment. Maybe they're offering a service with the best of intentions, but is, is how experienced or competent are they to be going into a family home and offering a service when there could be those underlying conditions or people who could be affected by the things that you say. And I've seen examples yeah. where investigators have gone into the home of a family and told that family, for example, that there's a demon in the child's bedroom. And you can imagine the effect it has on the residents in that home and potentially the child as well. Um, so it's a, it's, 
seen a lot of putting your own personal beliefs into those sorts of situations or copying again what you see on TV, which goes back yeah. to what I said earlier, where it seems to have gone from ghosts on TV to more demon based. Um, so hasn't it? Yes, it, it really has. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. We won't get into that yeah. element, but um, <laughs> that is a concern. Yeah, definitely. Just just so you say, talk about suffering. I know you're suffering a bit with the COVID at the minute. So I'll give I'll give you a little bit of a break, you, yeah. you know, a breather, <laughs> get a cup of tea or whatever. And I'd like to say, just like say, have have a have a couple of minutes, and then uh, what I'll do is I'll have a quick chat to people, and then I'll come back to you in a couple of minutes. All right. Brilliant. Thank you, Justin. Awesome. No problem. Right. Just obviously, it's it's for you guys are obviously at home listening to kind of Paul. He knows his stuff, and he obviously kind of passionate about trying to make things for the better of as as ever with this podcast we'll go through uh your questions to paul a bit when he comes back on a couple of minutes uh get your questions to him whether that's about you know his background like i say with with his his kind of tv background his investigative background or through the uk paranormal society um but also, what do you reckon the issue, the main issues are? That I mean, you, you heard from Paul there what the main issues of the paranormal. I've got my thoughts and ideas. Um, I think there's still a lot wrong with it in, in terms of growing trends and what people see as acceptable. Um, and and it would be a good idea to obviously obviously put put your thoughts, put your questions to him um, because there, there is a lot of, there's a lot of rubbish out there. And um, unfor unfortunately, it, it kind of tars a lot of people who are legitimately and kind of, uh, sorry, legitimately interested in the paranormal and just want to go out and investigate and, yeah, have a good time. And, and it's all good fun and things like that. But, um, yeah, it, it, I, like I said, I know that there are certain people in certain places that just won't have ghost hunting groups just because of bad experiences. So what do you think is the main issues? Um, start thinking, like I say, start thinking about your questions. When Paul comes back, we could put them to him just very, very briefly whilst whilst we're waiting and whilst we're kind of having a little chat now. Um, the guys from um, Haunted Magazine were due to be here last week. And uh, so they, they could make it because Andy Blessing was poorly. So we have got Andy and Paul back for the podcast, not next week, the week after next. They're going to be coming to so the very uh, tail end of January. They'll be on. We've also got Amy, and I can't remember her surname, which is really, really bad. But Amy, who's very much involved on Twitter and in Haunted Magazine, all about Shropshire. She's going to be on next week talking about um, the folklore of Shropshire and tales and folklore and ghost stories all linked to Shropshire, so which would be absolutely awesome. Really, really impressed with that. Um, that should be really, really good. But yeah, it's it's also all back back and running. So if you also if you if there's anybody who you think we should try and get on to this podcast, fire them away. And I'll I've already got a couple of names I've been trying to get hold of, a couple of people I've been trying to get hold of, trying to pin people down, that kind of stuff. So if there's anybody that you would love to listen to, to hear their opinions where and it could be a, an expert it could be an eyewitness it could be somebody who who manages or owns a haunted location a little bit like the guy who we had on from the conjuring house if you've got some ideas about who you would like on put it in the chat you know and, and start thinking because i like I said, i'm quite happy to talk to a whole range of people about this weird and wonderful bloody subject of ours right <laughs> he's back he's back you kind of you powdered your nose, Paul, and you I have <laughs> down a limp sip, yeah. <laughs> down a limp sip for feeling better. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Bouchard, thank you, Diane. Is it Bouchard Bouchard? Who's um Amy? So that's who I've got next week talking about Shropshire. Thank you. Okay. So um like I say, start like I say, fire I did have a really good question actually, a little bit earlier on from Louise, and I bet I can't find where the question is because Let's see if I can find it. Just bear with me a second. Here we go. So she's put, have you considered offering a verification scheme, if not already, as in this group is trustworthy? Um, yeah, very good question. So um, since we started um, discussing the idea for the society back when we started having the first meetings in January 2019, that's something we've been discussing. How do we give some sort of 
reassurance that a paranormal team is going to act ethically. But after lots and lots of discussion over several years, um, we realized it would be too difficult. It would come across probably as more of a paranormal policing uh, side of things. And how would we deal with complaints? So if one team alleged that another team had done something unethically, that means we've got to allocate time of our unpaid volunteers to investigate it. And how do we do go about doing that? How do we investigate such allegations? So it became very tricky. Um, we have been looking at other organizations, including over in America, uh, who do similar sorts of things. Um, for example, one of them is Seek Safely. So they um, they look at ethics within the um, spiritual retreat sector. That's set up by a family whose daughter sadly died at a spiritual retreat that was run very badly. Uh, so wow. they've now set up a, a not-for-profit organization in America to try and improve ethics at spiritual retreats. And they've got a voluntary verification scheme. So it's a bit like the code of ethics that we've got on our website, which is a voluntary code of ethics for people to choose to subscribe to, um, where spiritual retreats can um, voluntarily say that they subscribe to Seek Safely's code of ethics. So that's a potential, but again, it still begs the question of what happens when we get a complaint about a team or a group because we don't want to be the paranormal police. So we'd rather yeah. go about it through education and help the paranormal and heritage locations police themselves, if you like, and realize right from wrong and trying to improve ethics within the community rather than an organization being the ones who are policing it. This question here from Hayley, if you see, it says, do you know if any groups have been sued for trespass? There needs to be a deterrent to stop entry into supposedly abandoned homes. See, trespass law is to me this just seems a very grey area. That's that's the, the sad thing, unfortunately. It is. Um, we've got some guidance on the website, uh, and we're working on some more at the moment. So one of our volunteers is a qualified lawyer, which is really handy. So she is currently interpreting that legislation um, because it does differ between countries as well. So um, England and Wales typically has slightly different laws to Scotland and Northern Ireland. So we're in the process of putting some guidance up on that. Um, I've not been made aware of any groups that have been sued, but I have certainly seen examples, including one today that came to my attention where the police were called. So there's there's some photos circulating today of allegedly the police um, intervening with a group who supposedly broke into a historic location. This isn't really a question. It's more of a kind of statement, really. So brand more time with... Cam, so TikTok has a lot to answer for too. So many ghost hunters on there now who clearly fake activity, but people believe it's real. That that's to be honest, I think that's been an issue for a while. You know, it's on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, that kind of stuff. But there's so many people that literally go out to fake stuff because it it produces views, subscribers. But yeah, you do have a core of people that seem to kind of think it's genuine, which doesn't help. <laughs> Now, I see a lot of that. Um, one of the roles I've had over the last 15 years or so is supervising events at Woodchester Mansion. So I've acted as a key holder there and watched lots of small teams, event companies going through um, and sadly have seen a lot of, of faking of activity there. Um, but also seeing it a lot on things like the online videos and so on. And, and especially when it comes to the online videos, it's all about getting the likes and the viewers and the shares, yeah. isn't it? A bit like the TV shows yeah, again, exactly. it has to be dramatic to keep the interest, to keep the commissioning of that show. If it's not exciting enough, it won't get recommissioned and they'll move on to something else. So it's that constant desire to have those those hits, if you like, those positive affirmations that there's something paranormal going on. And as those of, as those of us that have done investigations know, most of the time it's, it's very quiet when you go out there. You can spend a whole night just sitting with nothing going on and that doesn't make for interesting live broadcast or television shows the difference being the television show may be filmed over say a 12-hour period and they can cut it down to 20 minutes of footage so you can get something from that but live broadcast you can't the lovely kev kerr is on he's saying what are the next steps for the ukps uh hi kev so kev was one of our um initial uh, founders when we first started so good to see you on here kev Next steps. So the first year that we've just gone through, that was all about just getting our um, foundation, if you like, getting us established, 
next up this coming year is trying to get a little bit more out there uh, as a charity get our name known a bit more um, and get more content out there in terms of these more topical issues like trespassing for example the issues of investigating in in private homes those sorts of things and also getting more uh, established within the heritage sector as well where they're not getting as much support so it's trying to get on ourselves out there a bit more now now we've got ourselves embedded and we've settled things it's now starting to do the promotion bit a bit more over the next year i yeah. say so i know that obviously later on this year the that um representative from you know the paranormal society are going to be at conventions and things like that which is actually really good it's, it's kind of something that it, it's nice because obviously still we are kind of very kind of niche and very kind of in the background still so it'd be nice to kind of progressively get the message out there that the oh there is another society now yet they they are actually doing it for the right reasons and all of that kind of stuff it is and it's it's just trying to get some of that education out there because i'd like to think that most of the people that are acting unethically trespassing going into graveyards aren't doing it because they are deliberately breaking the law or trying to cause harm or distress to to people like the families of those who are buried there they're doing it because they don't know any better they don't realize they're only role model is what they're seeing from others online it just sort of um is that uh, snowball effect where they're just copying each yeah. other so it's not where they're deliberately being unethical it's just that lack of direction and information so hopefully we can help step in there and provide a bit more direction i think you're right in, t- in terms of like when i first started going out there, there seemed to be this this huge number of people who were just copying zach bagans from ghost adventures and like you say it's kind of snowballed as there've been more and more groups and more and more YouTubers and more people are just copying bad practice from other YouTubers. And like I say, it's just getting really bad out there. Right, uh, question here from Louise. Do you have any ethical guidance on groups, uh, groups interaction with the general public stroke subscribers, especially in regards to social media? We've got some general guidance. I'm not quite sure where you're aiming at. Maybe um, Louise, you could just clarify that question. What exactly is that you're, you're thinking of there but we do certainly have guidance around um ethics interacting with the public and so on um but yeah not quite sure what you're you're asking there in your question yeah but like i said, I, th- I think overall like i say it, it's well worth i mean i keep on banging on about the website but it, you know the, the website is is really thorough really thorough you know you can you can compare it to other paranormal websites out there um and you'll you'll find that there is a huge wealth of information uh, that's been poured over checked double checked triple checked and uh yeah it's it's a very very good website to have a look at because it's 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 full of great advice like that wow what else have been people have been saying <laughs> John, John, jonathan cook stop them trespassing <laughs> oh, we would love to <laughs> If only it was that simple. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. I can see another one from it's... Jonathan about um, aren't graveyards public access? So that's a good question because that does come up quite a bit. Yes, this one, yeah. This one here. Yeah. So yeah, there's lots of locations where there's public access, um, but all land in the UK is owned by someone. So the graveyard, for example, is owned by the church or um, that runs that graveyard and access to it is being granted to the public under um, their terms and conditions. So things like national trust properties, properties, English heritage sites, parks and so on and graveyards, you're being allowed access to it for a particular purpose. So in a graveyard, you're being allowed access to pay your respects to your relatives or friends who are buried there. When it comes to an English heritage site, You'll often see, if you look at the website, that access to the public is there to look at the location during hours of daylight. So, um, as carved into their terms and conditions, they're only permitting access to the public during daylight, not at night. So, yes, although they are uh, given access to the public, they are owned by someone, and that someone um, sets the rules in terms of who they're going to allow in and, and under what terms. Believe this is Corinne, South Bristol Paranormal, I believe. So she's been said, I've been encouraging venues to talk to each other about teams and event companies, so it's more unbiased. Yeah, I mean that that's I mean it's always good to kind of for for the venues to talk to each other, it, like you say, in terms of you know who to go for, who to avoid, that kind of thing. So I kind of like that. So what else we got? 
Lorian, how do you feel about investigating the place of, say, an accident, i.e. an old train crash, etc., or maybe a murder? How does this compare in your eyes to investigating a graveyard? Good question, I think. Yeah, very good question. I, I've seen examples where... Um... Linking into the sort of the unethical trends and trying to find uh, the latest thing or the next best thing or the free location to get for your team uh, is people going out to the sites of perhaps a recent fatal car accident or a murder or a suicide. And these are um, incidents that have happened recently or certainly are within living memory. So their relatives, direct relatives um, who they left behind would be massively affected by a, an investigator or team going out there and trying to make contact with that person. So um, if it's within sort of recent living memory and there's living relatives who could come to distress as a result of those activities, my personal opinion is that that is unethical. And we saw that more recently with some of the um, well-known missing persons cases where some paranormal yeah. practitioners were, were using that um, as a form of promotion and they were oh, coming up with some very unethical well, things as a result so well that's it i mean you, you have so many kind of people going out there as soon as there's something like you say like that high media attention and they go out with a spirit box you know tr trying to get trying to get the spirit of the person that's gone missing and not even not even you know confirmed as died and that it's just horrendous it yeah. really is um but yeah there, there has been and that seems to be a fairly recent thing i don't know about you but it seems to be such a recent thing that people think that's perfectly okay yeah i, I, I just i don't, I don't understand people let's have a look oh Ke <laughs> kev <laughs> <laughs> see, see, do you know what he's properly stirring you know? <laughs> so how many years have to pass until it becomes unethical <laughs> trust care yeah um, yeah exactly um I, yeah. I don't think you can put a number of years on it can you is everyone's going to have their own moral compass um it's not for us to say after x number of years it's unethical um it's more about who could be affected by you doing that um and if there's direct living relatives then i i think um, it's probably going to be unethical if they could be upset by what you're doing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Let's have a look if there's anything. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for that, Kev. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just stir it up, why don't you? Let's have a look. What's this? What's Louise? But clarification: some people do interact with subscribers and say do. And or they do unethical things, such as asking for donations to fund investigations, hotel stays, basically staying safe online. Oh, okay. So I get basically. So yeah. So you've got your, your YouTubers and things asking for, you know, asking for donations for nefarious things and for for dodgy things like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think I that's, what you mean. that's a good point. Um, and we've seen examples as well, haven't we, over the last couple of years where there's been. Um, Arguments over whether those who are raising funds for their chosen charity, whether it's really going to charity, for example, and, and those yeah. sorts of issues. Um, where's the money really going? Um, that's, yeah, that's the big question. So, yeah, good point, Louise. I think that could be perhaps something that we could put on the website as guidance for the public about staying safe. So we've got it on some yeah. other subject matters. But if we if you think that that is um, a hot topic at the moment, when then we could certainly put something up on that. Yeah, and I, I said just just kind of pointing out as well, as well that the thing, one of the things which is on the uh, on the website, let's go back to the website at the bottom, is it scrolling on the bottom, on the wrong the bottom there, is that we every so often we do feature articles as well, so which is very much kind of linked to, like I say, it might it might be something that's very like say like a hot topic, for instance, in the media or something very recent and things, and it's like I said the, the feature articles as well go into quite a bit of detail as well, don't they, in terms of things which. Um, People may have come across, and it'd be our kind of take on, you know, reporting those things. It is, and we've just started uh, taking uh, feature articles from external writers as well. Um, so the most recent one, I don't know if you can um, print it up on screen, Justin, testing your technical skills here. Oh, oh here we go. <laughs> um, so, a second. Most recent one is uh, one on invented history. Um, 
Paranormal's Dark Problem. So that's an article by Dr. James Wright, who is a buildings archaeologist, and he's talking about the issue of um, histories being falsified or exaggerated by those involved in the, the paranormal. So you just see it on the left-hand side there. there. Yeah, invented yeah. history. Here we go. Paranormal's Dark Problem. And we've probably yeah, all come across go. it, haven't we, where um, the history of a location is perhaps a little bit exaggerated or embellished through the alleged findings of a paranormal group, uh, through what they've got through, through their devices or Ouija boards or, or whatever. And, and that soon spreads and soon that venue has a totally different history to the factual history. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, that, that's the thing as well, isn't it? That these kind of stories, like you say, they get embellished over time. And so it's it, it's it's being aware of that, isn't it? In terms of you know w what exactly is the truth? I mean, what I I just know from um, going back and uh, listen that, that there's there's quite a lot been said in the past about certain locations. One of them that I went to was thirty nine Degray Street in Hull, and um, yeah, the the owner will tell you a huge great history about the place, which is all linked to its haunted reputation. But um, one time I took the historian Mike Covell. And uh, he did the research of the, the historical fact on the property. There were two very, very different things. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, you'll see that on a few locations. Um, I won't name some of the other ones, but there's been some quite detailed studies done on the history behind some, which is nothing like the paranormal history described yeah. of the location. And Lorian again, what about, but what about historical cases? I don't agree with investigating graveyards, but we're, but we're trying to communicate with the dead. Where do we draw a line? Is a historical graveyard okay? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, so I think this comes down to permission. So um, it's about having permission to do what it is you want to do at that location. Even a historical graveyard is owned by someone. It could be a community group. It could still be the church. Who, who is it that owns that, that graveyard? And it's about checking that you've got the permission to go and do that rather than just rocking up a, with your devices or a Ouija board or whatever in the middle of the yeah. night. So it's about getting permission to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it, like I say, it's, it's kind of like it is in, it, I, I do love these kind of debates and these, mm -hmm. these kind of topics because lots of people will obviously will have their own opinions. And like, like you said, it's, it's their own moral compass. Mm -hmm. of, you know, how far do they take things? Yes. I mean, I remember uh, a while back um, when I was in paranormal truth we was meant to be, um, in, was investigating Canuck Chase near, you know, near Birmingham, and um, Canuck Chase is obviously linked to black-eyed children, UFOs, cryptids, you name it. It's all there on, at Canuck Chase. But we were there and supposedly trying to contact the spirits of these black-eyed children that are meant to be in Canuck Chase, and that's why we were there. But the historians then told us all about these child murders that happened in the 1960s, and their bodies were dumped basically on Canuck Chase. And so they were taking us to the 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 sites where these children's bodies were found. And we were like, we're not putting any of this in. You know, the, we, this is just a massive no-go. There are like 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 you said, there are relatives in the area, grandparents, parents, you know, the, the 1960s is recent history. And it's like, we are not putting any of this in. It's really interesting. And it's fascinating to be shown these sites and these places. But uh, at no point are we going to record any of this, you know. And it, and it's having, like I say, it's, it's having, making that judgment call of, yeah, this would be a good story. Yeah, it is a good story. It's a fascinating, grim story, but we are not going there with spirit boxes or Ouija boards trying to contact the children, these children. We can talk about general black-eyed children, but yeah, it, it's a it's a very, very kind of I'll say not it, it's just a, it's scary ground because there are some people that find that that's perfectly okay. You know, they they don't have that moral compass, unfortunately. No. Uh, and even if you are picking up on information like that through whatever sort of technique or practice you're doing, the next moral compass question is, do I really need to put that online? Do yeah. I need to share that? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And and the impact that that would have, like you say, on relatives. Um, because, you, you know, like I say, some people may think it's a, a grave is just a grave. If it's if it's somebody who's been buried there 50, 60 years, 
to me, that's still recent history. If it was in the 1800s, it might be a little bit different. But like you say, you could still easily offend, you know, grandchildren, great grandchildren by even promoting that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It's a fascinating topic. And like I say, it, we, I think we could probably debate it for <laughs> hours. <laughs> and the people, like I say, people will kind of still kind of chip in like Kev <laughs> <laughs> with, this, with his own thoughts. Oh, dear. Right. We are nearly at the hour. Just before we we go and finish off there, then Paul, uh, is there anything else that you want to say, or anything that you would like to obviously? Prom- obviously, we've been promoting the, the the society, but is there anything else you want to kind of mention before we kind of wrap up for the night? Uh, no, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Justin, and thanks to everyone who's joined with the questions. Um, all we ask is a bit of support. When you, we're still finding our way. We're looking for um, suggestions and direction as well. We don't know it all. Uh, we're not experts in this area. Um, we come with professional experience from our day jobs, but we're we're no experts in the paranormal. That's a whole debate in itself, isn't it? Um, so we're looking for um, suggestions, direction, send them through to us on social media or email if there's things you want to see on the website, things that you think we should be doing. Uh, just bearing in mind, we're limited in terms of what we can do because we are a registered charity and we're not the paranormal police. Um, we're also not a ghost hunting group and we're not going to be going out investigating cases or, or anything like that. We are an information hub. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, like I say, um, please do check out the website. It is full of information. Find your way around it. There's, there's loads of advice for all different reasons, for all different things, whether you are an investigator or whether, you know, you actually are, are, are manage or help to manage a historic location. There's loads and loads and loads of advice on there and uh, well worth, well worth checking out. So thank you so much, Paul. Absolutely Thanks. fascinating. It's been you, abs- an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, next, uh, and like I said, we'll kind of, we'll, um, we'll leave it there. So basically, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for all your questions, your comments and things like as ever for your support. If you could <laughs> say this every time, if you could, if you like this kind of website, aside this podcast and you would like to help us out, please do think about liking, sharing, uh, subscribing to the podcast. It really, really, really does matter. So thank you. For all those people that have already done that, thank you very, very much. And we're back next week, back next Monday. So until then, thank you very much, and I'll see you then. Bye-bye.